Hey, um, folks, this is the first ever uh, Peace Fork Frontier video interview. Um, we're announcing the launching of our new YouTube channel called Peace Fork uh, Frontier Video. And uh, today, um, amazingly enough, and by hook and by crook, we have uh, snagged uh, the famous author and historian and theater person Dan Henry. And uh, he's here, uh, just dropped in from somewhere else, and uh, um, we're going to have a little interview. And uh, what do you think about it's that? It's good man? to be here, Gresham. I love this place, and you know, Haynes is gorgeous. The mountains and the the fort here is uh, so iconic, and just great to be with you. Well, thanks. Yeah. And uh, so you've been here uh, off and on for for decades, uh, as have I, and. Um, you are a historian and an author, as well as an instructor of, um, what do you instruct these days? Communication. Communication. Well, that's the, that's the, uh, the pregnant question of the, <laughs> of the year, right? I mean, like, with all of these uh, devices that we have for communication, it still seems like it's our, it's our lowest uh, skill. That's because humans can't become superhuman with all the toys they have around them, they have to be able to be good communicators first, and then they can use all those tools. But people just jump in the tools because they're glittering ornaments, and uh, you know they don't become good communicators, they just use a lot of uh, uh, devices. So that's part of the issue, I think. Well, what does make a, a person a good communicator, uh, you know, than, you, you know, devices be damned, what, what is the, inner psychological con ingredients for good <laughs> communication. Well, I mean, I think you have to go back, I mean, you go to a lot of places, but I go back to Aristotle about 300 BC, and ultimately the most important element of communication is awareness of the other, uh -huh. is listening, is thinking about the other person, and not that you have to you know, completely change the what you're going to say because of the other, but the other is not going to listen to you unless you think about that person first and mold what you are saying to meet their needs. That's how you communicate effectively. Just talking about stuff that you like is not communication, but thinking about the other person and, you know, really tying into their specific needs is, is really the key. And a lot of that doesn't happen because you know, people think communication is, you know, on the phone, blah, 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 this is my life, da, 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 you know, and then you're done. But that wasn't communication. That was exchange of messages. But communication is really communicare, which is Latin, which means two people coming together. And so I could go further, but we'll just stop there. Oh, well, good. And, um, you know, so uh, from a historical perspective, what do you think is the future for for Haynes and the area, um, and you know how does how does history play into that? I mean, you know, I realize these are deep and provocative subjects that can't be said in a few words, but you know, nevertheless, I mean, we've got to start somewhere with. That. Yeah, I mean, this is, that's a big, broad question. It uh, is, but I think uh, I think you have to start back. If I'm going to look at Haynes in the future, I have to look at Haynes in the past a little bit, yes. and um, you know. Um, just very, very quickly, just a you know thumbnail sketch. Essentially, Haynes was um, originally uh, Clinket territory. Uh, there, there wasn't, a, there weren't a lot of Clinkets here. It was kind of a summer camp and a pass through, um, a little bit up the road, and then further up the road, of course, in Kluckwan were were the main villages, and then out in Chilkoot. Uh, when um, non-native people came here. They were given the land uh, in downtown Haines by the Chilkoot people uh, to put up their mission and to put up their school. And that was a moment at which the needs of both parties were attempting to be met. Um, and we all know about you know, missionaries for the better or worse, and sometimes that problem just got worse, and you know, certainly in Haines there was that. But from that very beginning, and this would be, you know, John Muir coming up in 1879 and establishing a contact um, was probably one of the first times that non-native and native people came together and had communicare. They saw each other and they understood 
who the other person was. And so that, I think, was real communication. Then you went through life, of course, racism gets in the way, economics get in the way, attitudes, perceptions get in the way, you know, that sort of thing. But Haynes has always been a place, at least since the late uh, 1800s, where non-native and native people could talk uh -huh. and interact with each other and share ideas. And it's not always perfect. Uh, humans have their flaws, all humans, doesn't matter you know, what color you are or anything, <laughs> but um, you know, people worked to come together. There wasn't like a reservations where the native people stayed there and didn't come into town. They were all mixed together, which is a very unique kind of community when you look at even the United States. Mostly people are separate, they're ghettoized. Here, people came together to share ideas. One example in more recent history, well, you know, 70 years ago or so. Oh. Uh, so that wasn't that far ago. Yeah. Uh, is uh, AIA, Alaska Indian Arts. And 70 uh, years? Uh, well, you know, that would or, be. Or 50, oh, 19, 1956 yeah, is when uh, the, the yeah. Boy Scout troops started. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was there. Yeah, you were there. <laughs> you were right there. So yeah. 65, 70 years ago. I mean, yeah, okay. That uh, yeah. says a little bit about how old you are, perhaps. Yeah, I don't think it's that. Well, that long ago, right? Okay, well, let's say 60, uh, 62 years ago. Okay. All right, I know when you get older, you get a little touchy about the years. Um, but, um, you know, in that time, uh, Carl Heinmiller, who was kind of a, you know, uh, battle uh, hard so Savvy. Uh, battle uh, savvy, you could say, uh, World War II veteran, yeah. uh, who had a history of working with... Uh, Native minority groups, groups yeah. other kinds of groups, mm -hmm. native groups. Fiji. When when he came here uh, to Haynes, he wanted to um, reinvigorate or invigorate the Clinkett Arts of yeah. the area, and so he talked to a number of the elders around here, got people over to um, what was once the uh, infirmary, and then he turned it into a totem pole carving school or art school uh, because he wanted to draw uh, artists here or uh, tourists here with the artists, and the artists were teaching younger folks like yourself, uh, working under, you know, uh, Tom Jimmy Sr. and other uh, great carvers, really. Um, and so that, I think, was one of the first big events and situations in this town where people came together and worked together to create something even more than themselves right. and their own narrow little history. So. I mean, I can pause there if you have Well, can, can we, uh, do you see any hope for doing something like that again? I mean, I realize that uh, the native people are not interested so much in in tourism or even in, in cooperation. It's, what they want to do is to, to do it themselves. But uh, so, say, what else could happen that uh, could revitalize the... Uh, the economy and, and recreate our society. I mean, with the with this new lockdown uh, experience with COVID nineteen, basically the bottom has fallen out of society. People are are locked down, and and as far as anybody's concerned, the guy that's walking down the street is a, a walking death machine. So, <laughs> right. right. Well, um, first of all, I would disagree with you that. Uh, that the native people don't want to see tourism or cooperation. I think that, you know, any a, a lot of the efforts, like the the um, heritage center out in uh, Kluckwan, was a result of them deciding our economy has got to be based on tourists yes. because it's not based on anything else, and that demanded a lot of cooperation, grant writing, other partners and teams and people. And now we have a beautiful heritage center out there. I know the Chilkudin Association is working on the same thing, and they're looking for partners. So I think that that vibrant native culture is really what's going to bring people here. There's a, you know, we all know history and current news, contemporary issues. There's a lot more interest in, you know, non-white people in America and their role. And I think that that role is very unique here. You know, an example uh, with the Peace Fort here. Uh, initially in 1886, uh, one of the military people in Southeast Alaska 
wrote a letter to uh, Grover Cleveland, who was president at that time, saying, if you're going to build a fort in Alaska, it needs to be here because these are dangerous people. Who knows uh, when they could you know, be a, become a volcano and uh, oh, wow. you know, keep any of the white people from settling here. And so that was the first effort, the first thought about putting a fort here, wow. was this perception of the Tlingit people as potentially dangerous, even though, even back then, they were cooperative, they were sustainable, uh, you know, they weren't always like right there with the white people, certainly. Well, they, a long they, time. they accepted the concept as a missionary and a missionary school, and in right. spite of the warnings of Skandu, the well, witch doctor, or the shaman. Right. You know? <laughs> right. And, and so, uh, uh, as time went on, uh, money was allocated by the federal government ultimately to build the fort, which was built in 1905. Interestingly enough, when the fort started being built in the late uh, 1902, early uh, 03, um, the main workers on the fort were native people. Uh -huh. And so and it, it actually created an economy for the, the town plus services. Services. And kept the peace between all the different factions, which is why I like to call it the Peace Fort, because originally that's what it was. Yeah, because you had, in a time when you had a lot of racism and separatism, up here you had white people and Klingit people working together on a common goal, and that was this fort. And the fort never enhanced or advocated uh, battle with the locals or anything like that. You know, they were ready, but ultimately, in just a few years, they saw that uh, ultimately the Clinket people were more valuable as uh, co-workers and colleagues rather than as something to be fought. They certainly weren't going to be fought in that way. So the whole attitude changed, and that's why I, I think the idea of the Peace Fort is good because this is a fort that was built initially to guard white people against the native people. No, but it, no, no, no. It never turned out that way. Well, it was going to guard the prospectors going up. It was going to be guarding, you know, they wanted to build a white community here and guard it against the native people. That never happened because the native people wanted to be involved with the economics and the culture going on, and they still kept their own culture, but they cooperated with uh, native people. Are all white people. Not all the time. Yeah. Things weren't perfect, but uh, I think this fort is a great example of the outcome of that kind of cooperation. And it still happens to a certain extent today. Well, you can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And more and more. And when you and when you talk about uh, COVID and you know all the lockdown and that sort of thing, I mean I see it as um, you know ultimately when you have people sitting at home or not going out and doing their things. I see it as maybe next year or whenever the coast is clear, there's a vaccine and that sort of thing. I see a huge surge in people wanting to get out. People want to get out and travel right now. And yeah. There's a lot of literature about that. By this time next year, they're really going to be antsy and really going to be wanting to get out. And because there is such a foment in the nation right now about intercultural communication, Black Lives Matter, etc., you're going to have people who are looking around for places to go where they can see that operating in a functional manner. And it's not completely functional here. Certainly, whites and natives have their own sense of dysfunction, but there are some real bright spots here, and I think people are going to be coming to the Haynes area more and more. The arts, the environment, the, uh, the friendly people, you know, just... The incredible freedom that you feel around here yeah. uh, is unmatched anywhere else. The outdoor adventures and, and absolutely, but, but and we also have facilities here because you know we have the barracks building, we have the hospital building, we have the hotel, sure. building thirty seven, you know the, the parade field. I mean, uh, and and the Chilkat Center, which is like a fabulous theater. Uh, which we've performed in many we times. Have, you know, you've directed me, I've directed you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? yes. And, uh, uh, so, and, you know, I think that the future for tourism, in a sense, is reaching out, getting people to come to Haynes specifically because we have something to offer. It, it's a getaway, it's a rejuvenation experience, it's a learning experience. And we could even have groups of young people come here to help renovate buildings, learn skills, do theater, do art Absolutely. projects. And, uh, and then we'd have a, a vibrant uh, experience that other people would be interested in either 
participating in or uh, visiting or uh, whatever. Uh, I mean, in the past, we've been relying really heavily on cruise ship passengers. We don't know for sure that everybody's going to jump on their cruise ships and head to Alaska next right. year. Uh, we don't know anything, really, for sure. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but I've been operating on that principle for most of my life. And, and so, you know, I, I feel like, uh, you know, it's not nothing really new for me. Uh, I mean, it is. I mean, it's, it, it, is a, it is a force that you have to deal with. But, you know, if you approach it from the fact that, well, we don't know anything, but we still have to keep taking our next step forward in right. some form or another. And you dance lightly. You've always danced lightly because you you have an uncertain you know world out there. You have to create with your own hands and your own mind. Yeah. And so you're somebody who has you know really skipped lightly along the lily pond <laughs> from lily leaf to lily leaf, I always looking for like new and exciting things and ways to create art. And uh, I think more people are out there looking for that sort of thing. And I think we're going to see even a greater enthusiasm and an urgency to enrich our lives. Because right now there's a lot of loneliness, there's a lot of perhaps boredom, people are staring into a screen a lot, and they want to come to some place that's quiet, that's friendly, that's surrounded by nature, where there's intercultural opportunities, there's art, Focus. there's a lot of wonderful things in this community, and it is unlike any place else on Earth. It is an unusual place, perhaps by geography, perhaps by the people who end up being here, uh, perhaps by the things that they create and offer, but Haynes is, is extremely unique, and I think people are gonna find that out. Well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but now you uh, you don't stay here all the time, and you, you used to be a school teacher here, now you're a school teacher in Eugene, Oregon, is that correct? Yeah. Well, um, a, a, a college teacher. Right, I teach at Lane Community College, uh, while I was here, I uh, taught at the high school, I ran the radio station, I worked at the museum interviewing elders, I did a lot, worked at the newspaper, did lots of different things, there were lots of fun, interesting things to do around here. Yeah. Um, and now I'm teaching at Eugene, working with college students. But mm -hmm. it's all, my focus has always been on communication, and the communication classes, types of things I teach are public speaking, interpersonal communication, environmental communication, how we talk about the natural world around us, small group communication, all those sorts of things. And of course, all of that is going on all the time in Haynes. Right. People are talking to each other about all of these things, and then they have to stand up and speak before the borough assembly. There's public speaking involved there. You of course, know. I, I was on the borough assembly for three years, and one of the things that I took away from it, and or even said at the time was, we are not communicating between ourselves. I mean, it's, it's, I feel that the, the, the structure is rigged for non-communication. You are, you are forced to have a three minute uh, session or speak at the beginning of the, the assembly and then, uh, then it's just dropped. And you know, the, the, sure, we can get into committees and, and hash things out a little bit, but in fact, you know, I, I felt that the lack of communication was big. And well, yeah. even, even communication between the different assembly members was almost taboo, you know. Right, and like I said, you ha if you want to be an effective communicator, you don't stand up and loudly declare your position and condemn everybody else. That never will work because all those people that you would like to bring to your side now are, you know, you've insulted. And so what you really want to do is in most assembly meetings, that sort of thing, is really think about your audience and what are their needs. You have to meet the needs of your audience. And there are five levels of needs. If you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's very, very simple. You've got to touch on a number of those. And you want to hear Maslow's hierarchy of needs? I can tell you very quickly. Okay, that's right. <laughs> okay, uh, the bottom level, if you look at it as a triangle, the big foundation is biological needs, um, which, you know, are people hungry? Do they need a break? I mean, just basic things like that. Sure. Next, if once you meet those needs, you can go up. The next level is safety. Certainly safety is a big need for people. You speak to that. The next level up, once you've satisfied that, 
is social. You interact, you know, uh, you acknowledge people's social needs. Then self-esteem and your ability to lead the life that you want. And then on the very top is self-actualization. Setting goals and meeting the goals and living the life exactly as you choose. Those are the needs. And so if you are speaking to people out there, you want to relate to those needs specifically because you want people to come to you. You don't want to condemn them and say, to hell with you guys. You want to bring them in so that people can really you know, foster a stronger community right. based well, on their you know, important needs. Yeah. Well, I did have a couple of uh, forums, community forums, that I put together to discuss various political-oriented topics and stuff. And, and it was uh, it was an eye-opener. It, it's Once again, I think uh, in, in my case, maybe it's, it's a question of not continuing, not following along those lines to, to make it more real for everybody. Right. But, uh, but you just keep working at it. You, have, you know, all of life is a continual education process. That's for sure. So. <laughs> uh, well, Tresham, I'm going to uh, go skipping out into this wonderful day yeah. and uh, enjoy the rest of town. And uh, It's been a lot of fun talking to you. Well, this is great. It, uh, it, now, when your book came out, uh, yeah. uh, what was the name of it? Uh, across the Shaman's across River. Across the Shaman's River. I was there at your house when yeah. the books came in the mail. You, you got and the I got the very coffee. first copy yeah. signed by you. <laughs> <laughs> so you are now the very first interview <laughs> on uh, Facebook Frontier video. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> and, uh, you know, maybe uh, some of the viewers out there, if they're interested in the history, they can check, it, check out that book. Too. Yeah. Um, well, sweet. All right. Well, well, thanks very much, bro. Hey. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah.